One of the most frustrating things you can encounter when you're a consistent fitness fanatic is overtraining. Almost everybody who works out religiously will run into this problem. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about the five steps you can take to bounce right back. This is a good one because I, we've we've actually been talking a lot, I feel like, about uh, overtraining, overreaching, mm -hmm. and I've personally, so I don't know what, what, um, what this uh, prompted this for you, but I've been getting a lot of DMs of people asking, okay, a lot well, of callers. Yeah, yeah. What do I what do I do then? Yeah. Or what are like what are the best things uh, to do if if I'm one of these people? And so I think this has been needed to address this. Yeah, the the really the understanding around this is I, I, one of the best ways to communicate this. I think is to kind of understand the difference between what's optimal, what's tolerable, and then what's beyond that. Right. So optimal when it comes to exercise is the right dose that will produce the best results, okay? And this is different from person to person, but there is a perfect dose. And the perfect dose will get you the best results re just, just across the board. There's nothing you can do better with your workout than what is the optimal dose. Now, beyond that is, what's cons is when you start to reach something called your tolerable dose, meaning your optimal's here, but there's I can definitely get away with doing more. But now what I'm doing is I'm taking away at the progress I can make. I'm actually reducing the results that I can get. So now my body is using more resources for healing than it is for adapting. Now, if I push that too long or go beyond that, then I really go back and I start to go backwards, which is where people start to realize, uh oh, I'm doing too much. I, I think we also have to address the relationship with adaptation and stress too. Mm. Right. So we understand that that exercise is a stress. Um, and so it's a it's a good stress. Um, and there's a lot of different types of, of stress that our, our body is perceiving on a daily basis. And there's a direct relationship with that and the recovery po process yeah. and the adaptation process. And so it's kind of a moving target. It's not mm. as simple as like, oh, this amount of exercises uh, per day, per week, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is what's perfect or optimal. For me, uh, it could be that week, and then yeah. the next week it actually could be different. So understanding that this is kind of a forever moving target, and you want to learn how to be able to read these signs that your body's trying to tell you that hey, you're overreaching. Now that you know how to read that, okay, now what do I do to cor to correct that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, are you just recovering to heal the damage that you inflicted upon yourself from your training? So you hit a neutral point, or are you actually recovering to the point where you're adapting? And, and progressing forward and the, it's, there's two different those are two different mentalities and like something you need to like really ask yourself in terms of like your programming and your training are you moving forward or are you sort of just maintaining uh based off of or even declining if you're doing yeah too that's much? the that's uh that was the big like aha moment for me is when i realized that healing or recovery was different than adapting yeah there's some crossover there but healing is and recovery is getting you back to where you were before. So if I scrape my skin, my body's going to heal that and replace what was lost. Now, above and beyond that would be would be adaptation. That's where my skin then develops another layer or two to toughen itself in uh, anticipation of it getting scraped again, right? And so over time, I would develop a callus. Now, what happens is if I damage or scrape my skin too often or too hard or basically if I do too much to my body, more than my body can adapt from, all it can do is worry about recovering. It's just going to heal, 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 heal. And so you end up in this, you know, I, I used to call this the, the breakdown recovery trap, right? Yeah. Where you go to the gym, you get sore, soreness goes away, you go back to the gym, you get sore, soreness goes away. Meanwhile, you're not stronger. Your body's not progressing. You're using the same 20 pound dumbbells, the same barbell. Everything looks the same. You're just kind of staying the same. And then eventually, if you push this long enough, you start to kind of go backwards. And then what people tend to do is add more volume, more training, thinking more is the answer when it's the exact opposite of what they need to do. I, I think part of the problem is uh, s some of us, the, the fitness leaders in yes. this space, have perpetuated this message. Or around glorifying failure training and no days off and the in the and pushing the intensity lever on people all the time and making it with the motivation and the hype and I mean I fell into that as a young a young teenager who was starting to lift thinking that like I wasn't trained what's keeping me from looking like this is I've got to train harder mm -hmm. more often and more consistent and that's why he looks this way and I don't look that way and you just get stuck in that 
recovery trap that you're talking about where you're constantly just tearing and breaking down while you're simultaneously not recovering or feeding the body properly. And so the body is just at this hard plateau, yet you're putting in all this, this work. And I think this happens to some degree to all people in this pursuit. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if you're consistent, this is what you, you tend to run into where you just, you're just, you, you slowly over time surpass what's optimal and you get into tolerable and meanwhile, you're not progressing at all. And then when you get extra stress uh, from life, all of a sudden you dip into this like negative results. Mm -hmm. And then you say to yourself, how is this possible? I was always able to do this workout before. Um, and now all of a sudden I can't do it. Now all of a sudden um, uh, this is causing problems. So this is an important thing to understand if you're looking for results. Now, if you just want to go to the gym and work out, then it, it doesn't matter. But if you're looking for results, then you want to definitely uh, listen up. The other thing too, you mentioned it, our, our space, the fitness space. When and, and I can speak to this because we're in the space, okay? In the sense that I know fitness influencers. I know people on Instagram with large followers. I know these people that have huge followings because of how amazing they look or how well they perform. And when they post their workouts, okay? They do not post their everyday workouts. They're posting the highlight reel workout. Mm -hmm. They're posting like, this workout, I crushed it. PRs. And that is not what their workouts normally look like, look like. In fact, and we know this. What's crazy is we know this. You look at professional sports, right? The the top top level of physical performance. Athletes have an off season and they have a preseason. They do not train like they like at their hardest level all the time. If they did, they would totally yeah. break down. They don't train to compete every workout. You can't. You just can't maintain that. It's not no. sustainable. Your body will. Uh, revolt. No. And also a workout you tolerated, you know, this week because you pushed the limit and you're like, wow, I could do a lot. You, that starts to compound. And so this is why cycling your intensity and your volume, by the way, this doesn't mean, and, and this is the similar conversation that we've had in the past about resting in between sets. Like it's not because you have to rest. That's what makes strength training, strength training. That's what makes you build muscle. You don't have to cycle down your volume and your training, because otherwise you're going to hurt yourself or whatever. You will if you keep pushing it, but really, if you do this right, it'll perpetuate progress, right? You'll, you'll continue to improve. You won't hit these plateaus until you start to reach that genetic limit, which is, I mean, that, that would take years to, uh, to get to. I can't, I can't stress how much more important consistency is over intensity. And I just don't think that's the messaging. Yeah. I think the messaging has been about intensity over, over consistency. It's like, you're far better off, you know, reducing the intensity by 50%, you know, fit, go 50% less hard and never miss, but, but don't miss. Yeah. And that, that's going to pay you way more returns than you trying to go as hard as you can, as fast as you can for as long as you can, because eventually that you, you hit a wall and you either one get hurt or the progress stalls. And then this is where people get frustrated and throw their yeah. arms up. It's like, man, I'm, I'm killing myself. I'm going so so hard, so consistently, and then I'm not seeing the results. Now, the key, the of, of the the best answer to this would be to avoid overtraining before you get there. Okay, but here's here's the deal: it's hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. Our egos get in the way. Workouts feel good, especially if you love the workout itself, like I do. And so I always cross the line before I realize, uh oh, I should have cycled, you know, volume down and stuff like that. So we're going to talk about what happened in this episode what you do when you're already overtrained. But ideally speaking, you should cycle intensities. Like we have a lot of MAPS programs. Uh, many of our MAPS programs, you should not follow over and over and over again. We've designed them so you go from one to the other so that you go through these ebbs and flows of volume and intensity and frequency so that you avoid this. So that's the key. The key is to avoid this in the first place. But now that you're here, some of the signs that you'll probably see um, that you know relate to overtraining are obviously stalled progress. So if you were progressing and then all of a sudden it's like the brakes were, were, were hit and it's like, nothing's happening. I'm not moving forward. In fact, here's a real good one. You actually start to move back a little bit. So it's yeah. like, wow, I didn't get stronger got weaker. for the last four weeks. I have actually lost a rep or two on my lifts. Mm -hmm. uh Oh, like that's a really strong sign of overtraining hot and cold intolerance is another one. You'll notice that uh, you just you need to wear more jackets, or you feel more overheated out in the sun. All of a sudden, you just you start to your tolerance for for hot and cold start to become uh, worse. Your sleep is affected. Yeah. In fact, this is one of the Restless first signs. Nights. Yes, 
this is one of the first signs they find in studies is that uh, athletes or people who train hard all of a sudden will have trouble sleeping and they'll mm -hmm. start to reach for more sleep aids and things that help them sleep. That's a sign, uh, typically. A lot of those like joint pain and different like tightness and things like you'll notice. I notice all the time when I go to sleep, it, it exaggerates then. Yeah, more inflammation in general is a sign of overtraining. Where yeah, you just or just general sleep. fatigue even all yes. day. You know, yeah. Just feeling fatigued and wore down all the yeah. time. Low libido um, would be another one. Um, your normal, whatever your normal libido is, all of a sudden you're just like way lower. Um, cravings. Cravings is a sign of just overtraining and overstress in general. And, and it's just because your, your, your body is seeking temporary comfort and cravings are different than hunger. A craving is like, I mean, I think, I think people know this when they hear it, but it's mm -hmm. like, uh, man, I'm really craving this specific type of food category, like sugar, sugar, comfort yeah. foods. Yes. Like hyper palatable processed foods, which we typically crave all the time. Anyway, they taste good. But all of a sudden, your cravings are like ravenous. Like, what is wrong with me? Why am I craving these things? And it's not satisfied with like healthy, a healthy meal. It's more like I need this hyper palatable food. That's the cravings I'm talking about. I think the point too of sharing this is not that that is like this direct correlation always with that. It's that that could be these some of these signals. Obviously, oh, you low, have more than one of these signs, right? Because yeah. obviously, low libido could be testosterone related. Obviously, cravings for certain foods can mean you have a deficiency in nu nutrients. So for all the trainer dorks that are sitting there going, well, that doesn't necessarily mean no, that. No. It's not that. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. If you were to list mm -hmm. these all down and you were to say, and you were to check them off and you notice like three of them or four of them, like, you know, they, they, they were true for you, then you're probably likely over. It's normally, to me, it's, it's normally paired with stalled progress, right? Yeah. So it's almost all, all the, all of them that we listed is almost always paired with stalled, not always, but most always paired with stalled progress. Because this is what sends me down the question of like, or questioning my client, like, oh, what else are you noticing? And then I start yeah. to piece it together. Yeah. Like that's, Part of our jobs as guides for our, for clients is to be able to gather this data and information that they're feeding you and then come to a conclusion because you're not in their body. So I have to get their feedback. And if a client's frustrated because they're not seeing results for the last you know three weeks in a row or what like that, and they're telling me, I've been following the diet, I'm asking these questions. And if I start noticing like, oh, we're this, we're that. We're we got to like, define progress too, by the way, right. because- if your idea of progress is the scale going down, you could very well be overtraining mm -hmm. and be losing things like muscle and right. weight because no. you're starving yourself. I like strength because yes. like everything else has to be going uh, right. Like you have to have a lot of things balanced and um, you're not going to be stronger if you're to get strong. Yeah, yeah, you just can't yeah. have these factors against you in order to get strong. It's just not going to work. Yeah. And that's I like, why I say paired with that, right? Yes. That's normally the first red flag is that. And is, like, what is, else is happening? Yeah, yeah, a client will complain to you that progress is stalled, meaning progress in the weight room. I'm not getting any stronger, or yeah. I'm potentially going backwards. Yeah. And they're looking at you, what's going on? And then it's like, okay, let me ask these other questions. And then I start to compile, like, oh, wow. Maybe we're overreaching right now. It's like your check engine light. That's the, if the strength is stalled or if it's going down. Right. But I like a uh, performance type progress as a gauge for progress and not the scale because the scale, a lot of people are so, you know, I've had clients where if the scale goes down, they will ignore all other signs. Oh, I feel fine I'm, because they're happy right. that the scale is going down. Right. So it's, the progress I like to measure is performance in the gym. Is it all of a sudden you can't do as many reps, you can't lift as much weight, you're not moving as quickly. It's like you can't get through the workout that you could get through before. Like those are the signs of, of, of this is true. Progress. But I do want to point out that stalled fat loss is also also, yeah. uh, also part of this fat category, loss. right? Because nah. yeah. like, imagine like you, for us, in order for us to maintain strength and lose body fat, we ought to have a lot of things really in balance. And yeah, if point. you start to lose or you don't see yourself losing any any fat anymore there's a good chance sometimes that you could be overtraining and the body is just, it, it's, it's trying to defend itself because it's like, Oh my God, they're starving me. They're overstressing me. They're overtraining me like this. And it's, so it's going to conserve energy and hold on. And a lot of times that is one of the signs that, Oh wow, we're not seeing the results. Such a not. good point. And you're talking pure body fat. It's such a good point because body fat is one of your body's number one insurance mechanisms against the, the, the dangers of the world. Like, if right now there was a major calamity and all of a sudden no, there was no food available, like obese people would outlive people who were super lean because they'd have all this stored energy, right? So that's that high, too much stress on the body, your, your inability to recover from it and adapt is telling your body, yeah, you're in danger and we don't want to burn body. And what it'll actually do is it'll actually organize its hormones in a way towards fat storage. 
in order to make that happen. And of course, it'll change your behaviors yep. and all that. Today's giveaway is Maps Aesthetic. To enter to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, Eight Sleep. This is the most advanced sleep system you'll find anywhere. It goes over your bed and it controls the temperature of your bed and it uses AI technology to read how you're sleeping and it adjusts it according to your sleep. It literally adjusts itself to make you sleep better. This is super advanced, amazing stuff. There's nothing like it anywhere else. Go check it out. Go to 8sleep.com forward slash mind pump. That is $200 off and free shipping on the pod cover by 8sleep. Also, this month's sale, Maps Anywhere and Maps Hit, both 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. All right, so the first step you should take, if this is you and you're like, yeah, I'm clearly overtraining. This one's, the first step's the hardest one, okay? But this is the best thing you should do first, and that is to take a week off. Now, here's the problem. When I tell people this, they go, oh, okay, so go easy for a week? <laughs> or, yeah. okay, so just kind of go lighter or, you know, do, no, 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 nothing. Take a week off. Now, the reason why I say that is because by the time somebody's here with overtraining, they've dug such a deep hole that it takes a week of nothing for the body just to start to compensate and start to bring that level back up. So then you can move back into adaptation. Simply reducing volume or simply going easier, that can work, but it takes a lot longer to work. You end up finding that the person has to do that for a long time before they start to catch up. Whereas when I had people just take a week off, and then we come back mm -hmm. and there's some other stuff we need to do. It's a good litmus test to see what happens the following week. You'll come you back feel? stronger. That's almost always what happens. You'll yeah. take that week off and come back. And no, I do want to define what that week off looks like. So people, because I feel like that we, you get to it both ends of the spectrum. Then you tell people to take a week off and they completely eat like an asshole. And they don't yeah, do anything. Yeah. And it's like, so Good point. there yeah. is like this, there is like, like it's a, a Let's week. Let's define it. Right. Yeah. There's a, there is a, it's Maintain a week off of in, in, intense, intense training or training many times at all, because the body is like you yeah. said, trying you to just stay active. Right. Yeah. I, I typically would prescribe us to, I would normally move that person if they were in a caloric deficit, right? Let's say our, our, our fat loss is stalled. Oh, we'll stalled. get there for sure. Right. So I want, I want to feed them and keep them moving for that week. It's just like just moving, like walking, stretching. Yeah. Uh, I love like recovery things. So if they're doing like yoga, meditative stuff, mobility, mm -hmm. like, so I like them to still be moving, but I also want the, the types of movements and the things that we're doing is to promote recovery. You don't take a week. Yeah. And the diet is a good one because a lot of people pair training with diet in this sense that if they're consistent with their workouts, their diets are on point. When they miss workouts, it's like, well, then screw it, yeah. and the diet goes way off. Yeah. So you take that week off, still eat healthy. You still want to eat healthy. Healthy eating is going to help with, uh, with recovery and repair. And then also be active in the sense that you know, I remember this as a kid. When I learned about this, I went in the extreme. I thought, oh, that means I, should, you know, I work out and then don't move at all, right? Not moving at all also sends a negative signal to the body to start to atrophy muscle. So you take the week off from workouts, but you don't just sit on the couch or lay in bed unless you're like sick or whatever. You go out and you have an hour workout typically at that time of the day. Well, now I'm going to go do an hour walk. Yeah. I'm gonna get some sunlight, get some nature, fresh air. Yeah. Do something uh, stimulating that direction because, you know, you're going to get a lot of benefit even just from the vitamin D. Yeah. I'm actually starting to incorporate more of this. I recently took four days off in a row on purpose and I came back and I'm stronger and better pumps. I mean, that's, that's what you'll experience after this week off, by the way, that'll tell you pretty clearly you definitely needed it. That's how, I mean, to me, that's how we always, cause you're not, we're, I'm not always hundred percent right as a coach, right? Like I don't always, I think like I, I, I gather all this data and then I determine like what I think is the best approach to what I'm, what are the feedback I'm getting from my client if I if I go and I I do this where I give them this week off, make sure they're fed properly, make sure they're doing some recovery movement, but not overtraining, not eating like an asshole. If we did it correctly, when they come back, they they always love that first workout back, yeah. like, meaning they're like, oh my god, I, I felt great. so good, or oh my god, I was stronger Energy than I expected. Roof, yeah. And in that first week back, we see some sort of strength gain and or the response from them telling me how amazing they feel. That's normally my sign that, okay, I was right. That was what we needed to do. Right. Now, the next thing to do, um, and you kind of want to do this simultaneously, and then again, continue this, is to get your sleep in order. Get really good sleep. Prioritize getting at least eight hours of sleep every night. 
you know, preparing for bed an hour before bed, I mean, you don't eat, you're not in bright lights, you're kind of relaxing, letting the body kind of come down. You're not eating within two hours of sleep. You're making sure everything's optimized in your room just to get really, really good sleep because nothing will make you overtrain faster than getting poor sleep. Meaning I, I can take the most advanced athlete or the most genetically gifted person and I can have them sleep just five hours a night for two weeks and I don't care what workout you put them through, they'll overtrain. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this has such a profound effect. In fact, there are times when all I had a client do was get a couple of nights of good sleep and all of a sudden the recovery went through the roof. So this is a big one and nothing, nothing will contribute to good or bad recovery like good or bad sleep. And, and this is almost always connected to this too. Yeah. Somebody who's overtraining is also have is almost always having a really hard time uh with with getting good sleep. Like this is becomes and this is why I really like the advice too that Justin gave too about getting out and getting in the sunlight and doing like mobility or doing something so you're still creating movement so that they're not like sedentary because sometimes mm -hmm. being sedentary all day, especially like if you're in here with artificial light like oh, we are, worse. it's hard for me to get into my sleep routine. So yeah. Getting out and seeing, getting sunlight early on the day, doing some sort of movement activity so I don't feel like my body hasn't been used or worked all day long, and then making sure that I apply the, the same attention to detail as I do for my morning routine that I now do for my evening routine as far as getting ready to go to bed. Well, and too, a lot of, the, a lot of cases like this of people that I've dealt with that are masking a lot of the symptoms by compensating with caffeine yep. um, and you know pre-workouts and all these things. So if you can you know, sort of like cycle that out, drink a lot of water, like, uh, especially if you're really focused on sleep, maybe this is the time to really dwindle that down for that week. And then, you know, see if that also was covering up some of the other. What a, what I'm, a great so, point. I'm so glad you said that too, because we didn't list that in this and that is actually uh, up there too, because you got that, that much caffeine could be overstimulating you. Right. And so then it's just another Adds more stress. Yeah. It's another thing that's adding more stress. And so reducing that uh, while also doing that could be a huge red flag. Too, it's, so. it's actually the best week to do it because I, a lot of fitness fanatics connect their caffeine intake to their workouts. Either it's mm -hmm. a pre-workout or, or you know coffee before. So now is a good time to kind of lower that, which also contributes to good sleep. And then you said going outside, getting sunlight earlier in the day helps with your circadian rhythm at night. And then if you're going to invest in any recovery tool, which we're not covering in this episode, but I will say this. Recovery tools that improve your sleep are the ones that are going to make the biggest uh, impact. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go with a recovery tool, go with the ones that help you sleep uh, better. The next one is to bump your calories, especially protein intake. So protein is, the, these are the building blocks of tissue in the body, okay? You need to have protein in order to repair and in order to adapt. And you need more calories to also do this. If you under eat, you can almost under eat yourself into overtraining state, regardless of what your workout yeah. looks like. Now there's an old saying, there's no such thing as overtraining. There's only under eating. That's not entirely true, but there is some truth in it. Now, mm -hmm. power lifters and strength athletes no notice that if they bump their calories, they can handle way more volume yeah. and way more intensity. That's where that, that there's phrase a recovery came from. element. There. It's not hundred percent true because you could overtrain regardless of how much you eat, but there is some truth to it. So at this point, Whatever your calories were at, start to bump them up a little bit, especially if you're in a deficit. If you're in a deficit, then bring yourself out of that deficit so you could repair your, your body and get out of overtraining. Again, I'm going to keep hammering the whole stress thing. You have to understand, too, if that you are in a caloric deficit, it's another stressor that you're adding. And if we are, mm -hmm. if the overtraining is what we think is going on here, we're trying to look at all like the low hanging fruit stressors that you're already causing on the body. Being in a caloric deficit, especially for an extended period of time, is another one of those. So, simply by giving your body what it needs or even a slight surplus in that is optimal for you to get out of this slump. It is. Now, people are always like, okay, what do I do when I come back? Do I just jump back into my workout? No, because you will quickly go back to where you were uh, before. When you come back, come back with half the volume. So take your total volume and just cut it in half, whether that be the sets or the exercise or whatever, just cut it in half and start there. Now, this is, again, not because you got to go backwards or we need to reduce, you know, we're going to slow down our progress. Remember, the reason why you're here is because you stopped progressing to begin with. You're not going to go backwards by doing this. In fact, uh, like clockwork, okay, I'll say nine out of 10 times, 90% of the time, this come back with half volume ends up uh, giving my clients or myself 
either close to or new PRs in their lifts. It's like, boom, they start to blow up in, in terms of the progress. Well, part of the reason why you constantly hear me say this on the podcast, that the goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change is part of that is me talking to myself, right? I know it's like, it's, I continually say that because I know what a challenge that is. Like I'm just as guilty as everybody else is of falling out of like my routine, not training for a couple of weeks and then coming back or taking a week off like this and then coming back and thinking that I need to do all these things and being wrong every time mm -hmm. going and getting done with that workout and then feeling myself like crippling sore the next day. Yeah. And, and it's just this consistent reminder of like, I didn't need to do that. And I always know like, like I'm doing it and there's always this moment in the workout when I'm lifting and I'm like, uh, I could probably cut it off right here, but I feel so good. Let me do another <laughs> set. And, and, and that's why I can relate to yeah. our, our clientele because I know that goes through everybody else's head when they're training and they feel so good and I could easily do one more set there, but it's not about that. I could go do another set. It's that what's optimal for myself. I haven't been training for the last week or potentially longer. If you're somebody who's falling off, there, it's not about that. hundred percent. There's a belief that, uh, that extra volume, uh, so long as you can tolerate it is innocuous. In other words, well, what's the big deal? I like to work out a lot. Even if I get the same results, I'd rather work out more than less to get the same results because I love spending time in the gym. It doesn't work that way. More than optimal means you get less results. So it doesn't, it's not like, oh, I can just get away with doing more and it's the same as doing less. Now I get to spend more time in the gym. You're literally going to give yourself worse results by doing more than what is optimal. Right. It's important to understand that. Lastly, so you've come back with half volume. All right, what's the what's the plan? After a week or two, do I jump back to what I did before? Again, the answer is no. Now, this was an absolute game changer for me so late in my own workout career that I, it, I'm, I'm frustrated that I didn't understand this earlier. The way that I used to increase volume when I understood overtraining and I'd take a week off and I'd do all these things, and then I'd come back with half volume is I just would say to myself like, oh, cool, I did half volume, I feel good. Let me do some more. And I'd work out and I'd be like, yeah, I feel good. Let me add another couple sets. I would, I would not incrementally increase volume. It very quickly jumped back yeah. to what I was doing before. There is a formula for you to be able to figure out what your total volume is. Now, the way I messed up before was I only looked at sets. I only looked at total sets. If I did 20 sets versus 15 sets versus whatever, uh, that, that then that was my total volume. It's not true. It's actually... Sets times reps times weight That's right. that was lifted. So in other words, 20 reps with a, in a squat with 300 pounds for three sets is going to be more volume than six sets with 500 pounds for two reps. Even though I did six sets with the 500 pounds, the total volume with the 20 rep uh, sets of squats is way more damaging on the body. Now, I use those extremes because I think everybody can imagine what it would feel like to do three sets of 20 hard reps versus just six sets of two <laughs> reps, right? It feels very different. Yeah. But it's important to understand this because when you take this, now what you do is every week you go up just a little bit in volume. Very Not incrementally. Yeah. Very incrementally. Now you can, regardless if you're low rep, and this, by the way, allows you to adjust your sets uh, based off of your reps and your weight. So if I all of a sudden bump the weight up and go low rep, I can figure out my volume and I can say, oh, I need to do this many more sets to equal the volume of last week or whatever. It allows you to calculate. A little, now, it's not perfect, but within the realm of what's reasonable, this is a great way to I, track. You still apply the the least amount possible for the most amount no of change, what. right? You still apply that philosophy here. And sometimes the least is nothing. I think that's a part that some people need to learn to accept and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to week over week always add weight, add sets, add reps. If you're seeing – in fact, I don't want to mess with it. My goal is to just not go backwards in volume. If I'm seeing progress, if I'm seeing, if I'm chasing, you know, aesthetics because that's my, you know, competition, or if it's strength, I'm going that route. Whatever I'm pursuing, if I feel like I'm, my body is making progress in that direction, even if it's incremental and small, I'm just not going. I just don't want to reduce volume or anything. I just, I'm going to leave it until I start to see that progress slow down, and then I'm going to barely move it up, and I'm going to keep playing that game of doing as little as possible, letting myself stay there with that much volume. Okay, it looks like I'm, I've gotten the most from that volume. Let's go a little bit more volume and then just incrementally moving it up over time. So, so you're constantly seeing this nice progress. This is maturity and it's it's really difficult. Like this is a whole nother discipline on its own yep. uh, to be able to taper off and and realize what what is my best dose for my body? Where, where am I actually 
progressing and adapting. Um, because yes, it's, it's initially, it's a really big discipline to be able to handle intensity and to be able to handle volume and to, to get to the gym. And, you know, there's different challenges, I think, in everybody's journey as they mature with, with lifting weights. And this is like, this is like black belt status almost for some people where it's like, you get so, um, addicted, not addicted is a word, but like very, uh, motivated and, and you get into the gym and you want to do your routine, you want to crush, but it's not benefiting you anymore. It, it you know, I know this analogy sucks if you if you're not familiar with the sport and you've never tried to play it but it, it just there's so many parallels to to this this game as a golf swing to me like of all the sports that i've ever played in yeah, my you life just try harder yeah, yeah. Like, suck more. like learning to swing a golf club it's probably of, the closest is thing, the yeah. hardest fucking thing i've ever done yeah. it's the, it's the and the most frustrating and yet can be the most rewarding when you when you hit it just right the sweet spot but it's like that's how like that's it, and it's so there, there's so many moving parts in the golf swing you you literally are activated from your neck all the way down to your toes and everything has to be in this beautiful uniform like for it to just there's an optimal there is amount just, of an, just the right amount yeah. and a little too much and, and it, it makes it off course way off course and sometimes going a lot easier and being consistent with the swing will send that ball way further than the your hardest gripping and swing and so it reminds me so much of mastering the the swing of a club and that learning curve that you go through that process of like you you can't just muscle your way to, to more is not better no and yeah. and and it's and it's not that simple to that you could just just because you know how to do it now or you know some things about it, like you figured it all out it's like it's kind of always changing a little bit there's always other little variables and it's like that's what we're, like golf reminds me of why it's so frustrating and yet rewarding at the same Look, time if you want better results if you want more muscle more fat loss better performance then listen to uh, what we're saying. That's that's the point. And, and just to cap this off, there's lots of studies on this. This isn't just based on our cumulative, you know, I don't know how many years net combined, almost 70 years. We've got of, a lot of, of anecdotes for sure. <laughs> but, but there's data. Like there was, I mean, one of the best studies was the one that compared the two groups of men. One group worked out for three weeks, took a week off, three weeks, week I off, love that three study. weeks, week off. The other group worked out every single week. At the end of the 18 weeks, I think it was 18 or 16 or 18 week study, they had the, they built the same muscle, they built the same muscle, and a, one group had a cumulative of 20, a month, like a month off, twenty five percent less. Yeah, they literally worked out seventy five percent of the time. The other the other group did. They built the same muscle. Then there's other more intricate and in, in more specific studies on strength athletes, where their deload week. So a deload week is what strength athletes would consider. Like, oh, this is how I'm going to prevent overtraining. This is my recovery week. They look at strength gains and muscle building. The deload week is where most of it happens, not during the most intense week. So if you want the best results, then you need to contend uh, with this problem. Look, if you love the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our free fitness guides. We have a lot of fitness guides and they can help you with your health and fitness goals. You can also find us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano and Adam is at mindpumpadam.